Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about AEW All In 2023, which was one of the best shows of the entire year in my opinion. It felt like everybody was angry. It felt like everybody in this company wanted to go out there and show everybody what AEW is all about, and I thought they did just that. AEW felt like AEW again here, and I don't want to wait much longer to tell you why, so let's just jump right into Zero Hour. We're going to absolutely fly through Zero Hour because it's Zero Hour. Um, the over-budget charity Battle Royale was won by Hangman Adam Page. It was pretty fun. It was your standard AEW Battle Royale. The crowd was popping huge for a real wrestler in Hangman Adam Page, especially on his entrance, and I really hope that starting Wednesday they give him something to do. The women's six-way tag was also very solid. Everybody seemed to be working really hard and bumping really hard especially to get the crowd into it, which they eventually did. My main takeaway is that we need Hikaru Shida versus Athena on Dynamite as soon as possible. Uh, the crowd popped huge for the face-off, which is actually kind of crazy if you think about it. Just, you know, the women aren't booked that well and they're still going crazy for them. Um, that should be reason enough to book it, but if there's not, that could be a women's match of the year contender very easily. Then finally, the TNA boys versus the Acclaimed. All I gotta say about this is that I'm glad it was on the pre-show. The ROH World Tag Title match between Dark Order and Better Than You Bebe was a really fun way to open the show, I thought. No matter how good the match actually was, the crowd was always going to elevate this into a match worth watching, just because of how much they love Cole and MJF. A great example of that being MJF's comeback spot after he had to go to the back when Dark Order hit him in the neck with a steel chair. Um, this was the most expected thing in the world, obviously you knew it was coming, and the crowd just went absolutely insane all the same. Talking about Dark Order, they did their part to build up that comeback with some really good heel work I thought, where they just were beating the shit out of Adam Cole. I thought they showed a lot of potential as a heel group throughout this match. I think with more time to grow they can at minimum be really good hands, just because of how good they are in the ring. Can they be more than that? I don't know, that's remains to be seen, you know, they've had a lot of time in this company and they were at their hottest a while back now, so maybe they can reinvigorate themselves, but again, we're just gonna have to see. This match finished up after the double clothesline and the kangaroo kick spots, which is fine by me because the crowd went absolutely nutso for it. But after the match, some real graps was set up. Joe was on his way to the ring and bumped into MJF just like he did seven years ago, which caused MJF to absolutely lose it, and it led to a pretty intense brawl. Something I couldn't help but think was how much I love when the champ is involved in multiple feuds at one time, because it just makes it feel like the championship is the biggest prize and everybody is gunning for it. Um, but especially when you're put against Roderick Strong and Samoa Joe, which is gonna be real fucking music. Overall, I thought this match was very solid. The Samoa Joe versus MJF setup angle was really well done, and it was a great way to open the show. The crowd was absolutely insane for it. The ROH World TV Championship match between Samoa Joe and Shane Taylor. This was the first of the two Haas fights, and I thought it was pretty good. Joe is Joe, you know what that means. Shane Taylor also did a really good job of kind of making himself look good and stand out a little bit more. I really don't have much to say about this match. It was an eight minute like back and forth a little bit. Joe was giving up, a, uh, you know, he was giving himself away for some good spots. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, I couldn't help but think about the Samoa Joe versus MJF angle the whole time. And just for that interaction, this match was worth being on this card. Darby Allen never misses when it comes to these big men, David vs. Goliath style matches, and here he proved that fact once and for all. Something about these matches just makes him seem more willing from what he normally is willing to do in a lot of his matches. He just goes kind of insane bump wise, and it's why this, this match over delivered to a pretty insane degree. Darby was great here of course, but I really don't want to leave Luchasaurus out because he was doing a really good job. He was doing some solid heel work, especially when he was stepping on the steel steps while Darby Allen was underneath them. That was a really cool spot, and yeah, he was really good here. The thing he was best at through this match though was just destroying Darby Allen, which is not hard because Darby will just throw himself into random objects to make it look insane. But because he did such a good job destroying Darby, it like made those classic Darby Hope spots just hit like fucking crack. Luchasaurus is so fucking large, so it made Darby Allen's Crucifix Bomb and the Avalanche Code Red just go absolutely insane. Those were the two highlights throughout this entire match for sure. The double tombstone into Lariat combo from Luchasaurus to end this match was really good, I thought. And like I said, Darby just doesn't miss when it comes to these kind of matches. 
I predicted Luchasaurus to retain, and I'm really glad that he did. Him and Christian, especially Christian, are doing a really good job of making this title mean something again, and this match only furthers that project even more. This was very good. I had a lot of fun watching this one. Miro versus Powerhouse Hobbs. This was the big men slapping man meat match, but it wasn't even defined by the meaty men in my opinion. It was defined by how much the crowd loved chanting for the meaty men. The beginning of this match was pretty slow, and I honestly thought it would be underwhelming because something about it just wasn't clicking. And then the crowd came alive with chants like Meet Forever and Holy Meat. As soon as Miro and Hobbs realized how much fun the crowd was having, they played off of that so well, and those power moves that they were hitting just started hitting a little fuller. Like I said, the crowd just elevated both men's work, and this was pretty easily Hobbs' best match in recent memory. His spine buster towards the very end absolutely planted Miro, and it looks so good. Both guys just seem super motivated to show out here, and that's exactly what they did. They elevated this match to meet the standards the crowd was setting, and I'm really appreciative that they did that because it needed that. Miro eventually gets the win and goes to shake Hobbs' hand, which Hobb, you know, does actually shake his hand and then attacks him from behind, which leads to CJ Perry's debut in AEW, and Nigel immediately calls her Mrs. of the Meat, which is a wild thing to say on that woman's debut, but it was perfect. She gets into the ring, hits Hobbs with a chair who no-sells it, but then Miro hits him with a chair and he's out of there. Um, Miro actually ends up not wanting anything to do with her. He was like shouting you're not real on his way up the ramp, and I'm honestly intrigued to see where this goes. I'm not sure how long I want these two together again, because Miro is just fine on his own, but if it's to add another layer to this character, I'm fine with it. This match was simply a ton of fun, the crowd's energy radiated through the screen, and I'm so glad that this match will forever be known as the meat match. Chris Statlander vs. Ruby Soho for the TBS Championship. Unsurprisingly to me, this match was a really good showing for both women, especially Chris Statlander. I gotta start with her entrance because she looks like a total star on her way to the ring, more so than many women in AEW do. She was also given a lot of offense in this match to really show what she's got, and I think she absolutely delivered. She's always hitting with such power and such finesse, it really stands out among any of the US women's wrestlers today. I said it in my predictions video and it came true here, both women's styles clash to perfection. Statlander just killed Ruby who sold it really well throughout the entire match. More on Ruby, I thought she looked really good here as she always seems to do when she's put in these big spots and I've really enjoyed her work as a heel. The match ending on an interference spot would have been pretty shitty if it wasn't for Tony Storm being the funniest character going in wrestling. Her just running around mesmerized by the bright lights was pretty funny and made the ending really work. Overall, I'm just really happy that both women stepped up and brought their A game to this show. It's really time to give Statlander a little more to work with in her in her feuds and let her show everyone that she deserves to be in those best women's wrestler in the United States conversations. On his return from a broken arm that isn't even fully healed yet, Brian Danielson decided to have an instantly classic, brutal as fuck strap match against the hottest rising star in AEW like the beast he is. Before we talk about the match, we have to talk about the final countdown making its pay-per-view return. It's always going to be the coolest shit ever, and shout out TK for putting that money he saved from CM Punk's contract to good use here. But dog, both of these guys were absolutely killing each other all match long, they left nothing on the table. Brian Danielson was crimson masked up within the first minute of the match, which really just set the tone for what this was going to be. My favorite spots of the entire match included the strap itself, which is exactly how it should be in a strap match. That's like the basic principle, but sometimes like these plunder matches lose sight of that. My absolute favorite being when Danielson first started whipping Starks with the strap. This dude was going absolutely full force and holy fuck the sounds it was making. Every crack on Ricky Stark's skin sounded like a gunshot, and that's not even an exaggeration. It was making me win so hard, I was going like, oh, I was just, you know, I was going crazy for each just sound alone. And shout out Ricky for being able to take that, because like, fuck that, I would not be able to do that shit, dog. Another strap spot I have to mention is the face-off where Ricky was whipping Brian Danielson, who was just no-selling it and screaming, come on, take it with me, leading to both guys just having like strap headshot battle pretty much, just whipping each other in the neck and in the head. 
that's just so wildly badass. Then the match ends with Brian Danielson choking out Ricky Starks with a strap, which he acted to perfection. It legitimately looked like Ricky Starks was fighting for his life. It, it was amazing. There's so much I can talk about. We didn't even mention the really cool Ricky Steamboat versus Big Bill interaction, but there's just so much to cover. This is one of those matches where I don't even feel like I can review it properly. All I can do is just tell you if you haven't seen it to go watch it, and if you have seen it, go watch it again. This match had one day to build, and it felt so personal and so full of heat, and You'd expect that sort of thing from Danielson. Danielson is able to do that easily because he's just the best. But shout out Ricky Starks. With a match like this under his belt, he is an absolutely made man. This is like a true sink or swim moment for the guy, and he fucking swam like he was Michael Phelps. What an absolute classic match that's probably one of my favorites of the entire year. Violent wrestling matches like this are forever going to be the coolest shit, and wrestling is always going to be cooler than what you like. Kingston and Shibata versus Claudio and Yuta. I enjoyed this match for what it was. All four guys had really good chemistry and were working really hard to get the crowd into it, even with its placement on the card. In a way, this kind of felt like the teaser for all the singles match we could possibly be getting between these four in the ring, which is fine, but it kind of did put a ceiling on what the levels it could reach as a tag match. All the interactions were gold though, so I can't even be mad about it, especially Shibata and Claudio, which I kind of thought that Shibata must have heard that Claudio wanted to work the G1 and just decided to give him a little taste of what it would be like because he was absolutely killing him and that's a match I absolutely need in the future. The match I need to see in the more immediate future though is Eddie versus Claudio, which was the focal point of this entire match. Claudio wouldn't even get in the ring with Eddie for a while, but when he finally did, it really felt big time. But this match ultimately did end with Claudio pinning Eddie, which kind of threw me off. That was just so out of nowhere, it really didn't build at all, and I'm really confused about the option to have Claudio pin Eddie, because I thought they would have it be the opposite, so that we could have the match at Grand Slam, but there's got to be another way to get to Grand Slam, because you've got to give New York that match. You've got to give Eddie Kingston that match. I would say give Eddie Kingston the world title match like with MJF, but MJF is so busy right now and I think he's got other stuff lined up. This is the match. They've been building it on TV. This cannot be the end of it. I really, really, really hope they find a way to make this match happen. I just need that to be the moment where everything goes right for Eddie and he finally gets to win. It just feels like it's too right of a moment for him. Overall, this was a very fun match. It was placed at a kind of weird point in the card where they really had to work to get the crowd into it because they were just tired at this point. I mean, you're, you're sitting behind Danielson versus Starks. It was always going to be difficult. But I think the biggest takeaway you can get from it is everybody wants to see Eddie versus Claudio give us that match at Grand Slam. Kenny Omega versus Konosuke Takeshita. These two guys decided to have a Japanese strong style match and it worked really well because there's no two guys in the world that could do it better. The whole thing was about as back and forth as you can get. They were throwing bomb after bomb one after the other. They just gave you no time to breathe between their spots. Takeshita was presented with so many opportunities to shine. Kenny was giving him so much. He was selling his ass off especially right from the get-go where he just took this disgusting backdrop driver on the neck like he didn't even need to walk like he, he doesn't need his spine it's all good we don't need that it was so obvious that Kenny wanted to elevate Takeshita in this match and I thought he for sure did like I don't know how anyone can see Takeshita hit a top rope blue thunder bomb and not see the vision with him as world champion. The callous interference at the end didn't take anything away from this. If anything, it added to the story because because that didn't work, Takeshi had to do it on his own, and he did do it on his own, actually pinning Kenny clean as a whistle, which left the crowd in this like mesmerized, stunned silence, which just felt so right. This is exactly what I wanted to see. I wanted to see Takeshi pin Kenny Omega clean, get that amazing rub, and now it's all up to Tony Khan to elevate him to the top of this card. You just have to. You cannot waste a talent like this time. Like, we're ready for Takeshi at the top right now. But as a match overall, I sadly think that the build truly let it down and kind of held it back from being as good as it could have been. 
This match was full of intensity, it was full of amazing spots, Kenny and Takeshi were working their asses off, so as a match as a whole, it was awesome, but I never really felt the anxiety that I felt I should've when it comes to Kenny losing, and I think that's just due to the build. If anything though, like I said, the match was still very good, I just don't feel like it reached that next level because of the build, so I think when we run this back in however long, we gotta give it more time, let it develop, and let these guys have an instant 5 star. I thought this was a little bit below that, but like I said, it's time to give Takeshi a run at the top. He is so talented, he is so fast, so smooth in the ring, like Oh my god, his chops are so incredible. They're better than anyone else's. It makes everyone else's look like shit, to be honest. And I'm just ready for that, man. That's all I gotta say about this. FTR and the Young Bucks versus Bullet Club Gold. The atmosphere for this match was absolutely insane. The crowd was almost evenly split on their feelings about the Bucks, and it elevated the hell out of this. I can't even lie. Firstly, let's just talk about Bullet Club Gold, who are the coolest group in wrestling right now to me. I'm such a huge fan of them. When you see that entrance where the guns, they have that spotlight and they're shooting water and shit like that, with all four of them, it is the coolest shit ever, and I just love it. And one more thing about Bullet Club Gold before we start talking about the Young Bucks, because obviously the Young Bucks are kind of the star of this match. Um, the gun's good, I'm afraid. It's time to start giving them credit. They're super smooth in the ring, and yeah, they're, they're good. The gun's good. Anyways, the Young Bucks, like I said... They were the stars of this match, and it, they honestly felt like themselves again. They were finally being charismatic, chaotic little shits in the ring, and it was honestly beautiful to see. Like It's kind of like they heard that CM Punk was out of their company, and they were like, fuck y'all, we're going to remind you who we are now. We're actually going to try, you know? Some expected but still really cool bits of tandem offense between them and FTR. The mirroring sharpshooters, the frog splashes, you know, that sort of thing. I thought that shit is so cool. I, I don't care. They were perfectly in sync for that sharpshooter spot in particular. That was awesome. FTR and the Young Bucks were working together. Like I said, they were hitting those tandem spots, even hitting each other's finishers at one point. But there was some notable tension between the two groups, kind of refusing to tag each other in the beginning of the match. And I really liked that because it was just a simple way of showing that the feud isn't over, especially because they lost to Bullet Club Gold here. You know that one team is going to blame the other for that loss, and it's going to lead to a match at full gear, which I am so ready for. I thought that their match at Wembley kind of underwhelmed. I haven't gone back and rewatched it yet. Maybe it'll change after the fact, but I'm ready for the, another match between these two groups because if the Young Bucks are working like this again, five star, easy. Basically though, this match was for me. It was filled with all my favorites, a lot of people I really enjoy, and I don't even care how chaotic it got at times, I was always going to love this, and I absolutely did. When you think about AEW, some of the first two names that probably come to mind are John Moxley and Orange Cassidy, so what better way to close out a statement show than with these two guys? The entrances alone gave this match an incredible big fight feel. Mox and OC both doing their Goldberg ass entrances alongside their groups was insanely cool. This match absolutely lived up to its main event status. It felt like the perfect finale to what has been an incredible reign as international champion from Orange Cassidy. Everything had just added up here. It felt like whatever Mox did, whatever area of the body he targeted, it would be like he had just been working that over for many minutes because OC was just hurt everywhere. So Mox could just hit him in the, I don't know, like quad, he'd be done. He could hit him in the calf, he'd fall over. OC was just broken down at this point. Poor OC was just getting brutalized. He was trying to have these little comeback moments, but it just wasn't working. Mox would shut him down every time. He gushed blood throughout the entire match. Even when the match ended, he was gushing blood. And yeah, it was just, honestly, it was like, damn, this man has been through so much. My favorite spot of the whole match, maybe even of the whole year, was when OC started throwing out, you know, his low effort kicks like he was done for and just kind of like trying to get in Moxley's head. Moxley bit it and fell for it. And then as soon as he started to kind of like play along, OC just started full force slamming Moxley with kicks to the head. It, it was awesome. That was just the perfect encapsulation of everything OC's character arc has been. And I went crazy for it. Mox tries to wrap this up with the Death Rider, which OC somehow kicks out of, stands up, tries to go for the hands in the pockets,
but then just flips John Moxley off as a last hurrah before he goes down for the one, two, three. That was such like a very satisfying conclusion to what has been, again, an incredible international championship reign. OC is a true main eventer in this company and deservedly so. He has been absolutely incredible in everything he's done over the past nearly five years and just what an amazing way to give him a moment. I'm also pretty excited to see where Moxley takes the international title from here. There's a lot of potential to tap into that could give us a new set of banger TV matches to look forward to every week. The show went off air with all the fans in the arena chanting for Orange Cassidy while he just stood in the middle of the ring bloody faced. That was just the perfect encapsulation of what this show was, man. It felt like the rejuvenation of AEW. All the energy that I'd felt and kind of lost over the last, I don't even know how long, just came rushing back to me. Through all the backstage bullshit, every single one of the performers on this card came out and gave it their all to make this show an all-timer, which is just exactly what AEW is all about. It's the heart of this company. When AEW has its back against the wall, when things are just going wrong in and out of its control, they just always deliver these incredible shows, and that's exactly what happened here. I really hope that this is like a sign of something. This isn't just like a one-off note. I want this energy to continue throughout the rest of the year because as a fan, this is the kind of shit that gets me so excited to tune into their weekly television show and just watch week after week, make videos on it. Like, this energy is why I love professional wrestling. I'm just so happy that this show delivered. I, I was... You know, I, I was on record saying that I wasn't sure about this card. There was a lot of people that said the same, but I also said that I thought it would deliver, and it delivered even more than I thought it would. This needs to be a moment for AW. It needs to be kind of where they course correct and go back to where they were a few years ago, because that's all they need. They just need a, a good run of insanely good TV like they, I've seen them do, and I, I would be really excited to see that. Before we do end up wrapping this video up, I wanted to say that while this channel has mainly consisted of reviewing wrestling and kind of like predicting it, uh, just because of how much wrestling has been going on, there is going to be more fun stuff on here. I have a tier list plan, I have future champions, you know, predictions plan, uh, another prediction show. It's not like that, you know what I mean? Um, but just more fun stuff, so if you love pro wrestling content, if you love to talk and listen and, you know, interact with pro wrestling subscribe to the channel, like this video down below, comment what your favorite match is, and kind of how this show made you feel. I feel like that's the most important thing coming out of it. I, I That's the thing I want to know the most. If you guys do want to see my star ratings, I do have a link down below. Also, I have a link to my letterbox because why not? Maybe I'll make a link to my Spotify. Maybe maybe I'll fill you guys in on what I'd be listening to. But um, yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed this video again. Leave a like because it really helps me grow this channel and hopefully get better and better at this. So, uh, yeah, much love, y'all. Peace.